Gentleman from Florida, and I'm pleased to offer this amendment with him. I do agree that it's critical that we have this debate on what we should be spending on our military while I respect the work of the Budget Committee. I also call attention to the views of the Chairman and the Ranking Member of the uh, Armed Services Committee on which I uh, sit, that they would spend $577 billion on defense next year, which would eliminate sequestration. I suggest, as the uh, gentleman from Florida did, that we need to look to the views of the National Defense Panel which did draw from Secretary Gates's fiscal year 2012 budget, projecting into fiscal year 2016. Why Secretary Gates had a reputation as a reformer, he had already found over $450 billion of savings in the Department of Defense at that time. It's hard to say there was much fat left. Second, as the gentleman from Florida pointed out, that was the last time the Department of Defense engaged in what we should do in this body, which is the budgeting for the military based on the threats that we face and the strategy we need, not having a strategy that is driven by the budget. But that's not enough. As the National Defense Panel said itself, at $611 billion, that projection is not enough. And why is it not enough? Some of the threats that the gentleman from Florida identified. In the last four years, what have we seen? The Islamic State on the rise, rampaging across Iraq and Syria, Iran racing towards a nuclear weapon, even as it exerts greater control and dominance over Baghdad, Damascus, Beirut, and now Sana'a. We've seen Russian revisionism invading a sovereign country in the heart of Europe, shooting a civilian airliner out of the sky in the heart of Europe, and China on the rise, developing military capabilities that are quite clearly directed against the United States and our allies in the first island chain. That is why we need this debate. That is why we need the military budget the gentleman from Florida and I are proposing. Because the eyes of the world are upon us. Not just our enemies, but our allies as well. Wondering if America will not only have the resolve to stand by its commitments, but if it will have the capabilities to stand by those commitments, whoever the commander in chief may be. But there's one final important group whose eyes are on this institution this week. It's our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, and our Marines who are wondering if the elected representatives of the people will stand with them, will provide them the resources they need to be ready to be trained, equipped, ready to fight our nation's wars so they don't have to fight them in the first place. Earlier today, I had the great benefit of being able to meet with a group of Army majors and captains, the mid-career officers, just like the mid-career non-commissioned officers who are the backbone of our military. Two of those men I started officer candidate school with Fort Benning at 10 years ago this coming Friday, one of whom has been seriously injured. To a person, they all said that training is down, families are strained, operations are stressed, equipment is overused, and they wanted to know, will the Congress of the United States give them the tools they need to fight and win our country's wars. That's why I'm proud to stand here with the gentleman from Florida to offer this amendment and say that yes, we will stand by, by them. And yes, we will make sure that they are ready to fight and win our wars so they don't have to win them or they don't have to fight them in the first place. And now I'd be happy to yield back to the gentleman from Florida. I would just, uh, not much.